Hey everybody, welcome to Stocks for Breakfast. In today's video, we're going to discuss a trade setup that we kind of invented that's called the bullish echo, something you've probably seen before but never really understood how to trade because it's actually a really important thing to understand. When you start to see massive bullish action, the first thing you want to do is jump in there, but you got to slow down. And we're actually going to talk about reminiscence of a stock operator today and how Jesse Livermore solved this problem 90-something years ago. We're also going to jump into something that's pretty interesting, which is making the distinction between which stocks you can expect momentum and which kinds of stocks you can expect slow grinding trends and how you should be trading those two different setups differently. It's very, very important to recognize that every stock doesn't trade the same way. However, certain stocks have certain characteristics that you need to level up, recognize, and make sure you have the proper trade management. And I'm going to show you one trade that has actually set up as a new bullish idea, but the previous bearish setup, the exact one that I'm about to show you, had at least a 30-point gain where you really didn't even have to sweat it out at all. We're also going to talk about last week's trading and how our core philosophy is that the entire job for you, as an active trader, is to manage risk until a few trades work out. We get a lot of people that come into our community or, or want to come into our community. They're like, hey, Joe Blow on YouTube said that he has a 90% win-loss percentage. I got to tell you, I don't want to try and be that perfect all the time. It's not necessary on top of that. And it's a heck of a lot more stressful than understanding trade management, position management, and how that plays into risk-reward ratio. And risk-reward ratio is going to be a giant topic for this week, which kind of ties us into the bullish echo setup. So I really want to get into the bullish echo because it's really important. Um, we're going to actually start out with those. So stick around. I'll be back in just one second. Okay, so we have to set the tone for the week so that we understand what kind of profit-taking scenarios are on the table for this week. So if you remember back to last Monday at exactly this time, you can go back to the videotape. We actually called the bottom in the S&P 500 based on something called the average true move. And we got a bunch of really good questions about that. So I actually want to kind of hop into that first, and then we're going to talk about the bullish echo. We're going to go line by line for all of the ideas that I'm looking to trade this week, how they're setting up, how I plan to manage any open momentum trades that are on the table right now. But I want to start out with, um, we got some good questions about the average true move and how that plays into uh, when to enter new trades and how that kind of plays into what we call the optimal entry. Now, the reason I'm bringing up the optimal entry is because there's very few trades at an optimal entry this week. If you happen to be watching this video six months from now, the market actually bottomed out, rocketed higher and traded into what we call the bullish echo. But first, I want to kind of tie how we called the bottom last week, how that translates into trading this week. And we're going to bring that all the way back with probably the easiest description of it, which is by using a day trading indicator called average true range. So let's actually kind of work our way into that. I want to make sure I say hello to everybody. Hey, Joseph, thank you so much for being here again. Really appreciate it. Dustin. Absolutely awesome to meet you in person at our live event. That was amazing. And Don, welcome to our community as well. So what I want to first do is I want to work our way over into, um, let's actually go into here and let's pull up Tesla as an example, right? We'll pull up Tesla. And when you pull up a lot of these stocks, there's going to be all of this data. What I want to focus on is this little thing over here, average true range. So when you happen to be, if you happen to be day trading Tesla, average true range is basically what the stock does from the low to the high. So that's the average amount of volatility for as a day trader, you would expect to have that stock. Now, remember the word average in there. Of course, some stocks could do a lot more than that, but that's the average, right? So what does that mean? How does that translate into the optimal entry? And what the heck does that have to do with the bullish echo heading into today? So be patient. I'm going to tie this all back together because it's really, really important for how you plan to manage trades now, as soon as Monday opens, it's a really important thing. And again, getting back to what Jesse Livermore said way back in the day, right? So if you're day trading Tesla and you're about to hit that buy button, you have to ask yourself, based on where it is right now, if we know $10 is what it normally does, how much of that $10 is still remaining in what it normally does? So if you're about to hit that buy button, maybe you buy after the first 15 minutes or the first 30 minutes, 
You have to look at the stock and say, how much profit potential is left? Trust me, I'm tying this all the way back to how we're going to swing trade this week. So if there's $8 left, let's say you buy early in the morning, 30 minutes go by, there's still $8 left in what it normally does. So again, I just want to give you a round number. So let's just say for argument's sake, Tesla closed at 223, opens up, and it normally does $10 intraday from the low to the high. So 223 is where it closed yesterday, and now maybe it's at 225, right? Let's say 30 minutes after the market opens. So it went $2 from the low to the high of what it normally does. That means that on average, there's still $8 left. So there's still pretty good profit potential in that trade. You just have to make sure you manage your risk. That makes sense for the $8, right? But if let's say it's in the afternoon or let's even say it's 11 o'clock, the stock just rocketed higher and it normally does 10, but from the low to the high, it already did nine. So that means that most of what Tesla normally does is already used up, but maybe there's just a little bit more left. So number one, it's too far from the optimal entry to justify solid risk reward to take that trade. Remember, the only reason we choose to accept risk is because the likely reward is still on the table. It's still available, right? So how does that tie all the way back to what we're looking at right now in the market? And that's kind of tying it back into what we have, which is called a bullish echo. So if we kind of work our way over to what the market looked like last week, just to give everybody full context of what it looked like, it's just absolutely amazing, right? So if we kind of work that way into the SPY, the S&P 500, you can actually see how far it came in a very short period of time. Now, I want to give you two quotes that uh, one you can use, implement immediately. And number two is one that I had on my trading floor. One of them is about, one of those about food, but it applies to trading. I want to make sure I say hello to Tim. Tim, good morning today, pal. So here's where we're going, right? I want to, I want to kind of bring this into um, the real world, so to speak, right? We always want to have something that gives us something to trade. The list of bullish stocks went from 29 to 204 in less than seven trading days. Absolutely amazing, right? Yeah, baby, we all like to be buyers. It's so much easier. Get that short side of the market out of the equation, right? Let's go get them. Well, no, <laughs> slow down. And this is where the bullish echo comes in. We called the bounce last week, but this was more like an out of control gusher. This is where rookie traders get in trouble. So now raise your hand if this has happened to you. As soon as you buy the stock, it moves in your favor one day. And then violently it goes back in the other direction the other day and the, the, right after that, right? This is really the quote that you want to know. And I'm going to highlight this for you because it's really important. Exiting a long is not a short. It's like saying I ate less cake, therefore I ate healthy. Let's let that sink in for a second. If you don't know the terminology, a long for stock traders means that you bought stock. You bought the stock, therefore you are long the stock right? Short selling means that you've identified a scenario where you think there's a good chance it will go down. So you're actually betting that the stock will go down. Now, what I just said there is very, very important. Good chance it will go down. So let's talk about this right now. The reason that we choose to accept risk on an idea is because it's very likely, not definitely, but very likely to move in a particular direction. Now, right now, if we take a look at all the stocks in the market and we're kind of looking at this, this is obviously going up, right? Very, very strong move to the upside. So let's put this into trading language so that we can all really kind of wrap our head around this. A good buying opportunity is not a good short selling opportunity simply because that move you perceive is over. Number one, we're not even saying it's over. This is where bullish echoes come into play. A stock that has a violent move or a really strong move into one direction. And here's where I want to kind of tie back what I just talked about with Tesla. Tesla has an average true range of roughly $10. But Tesla for a swing trade over a longer period of time has a much bigger move. So that's kind of what we're tying into the market right now. When you look at a stock, and let's, I'm just going to use a, a, an example. Let's use the $10 example again, right? So let's say a stock normally moves over a five-day period, $10, just to keep the math super simple, right? Let's say that it's already moved $10. Now, if we know the reason we want to you know, take our wallet out and choose to accept risk, we should only be choosing to accept risk because the amount that we're going to risk 
and the likely profit potential sets up a really good risk reward. Now, here's the part that everybody messes up. You kind of go into your calculator and you're like, okay, risk reward is three to one. It's perfect, right? That's basic math. That has nothing to do with whether or not it's likely to hit the three versus whether it's likely to hit your one. So if we kind of tie this back into what the market's doing right now, what are the odds of risking today for a new position to justify the risk based on what it just recently did compared to where it needs to go? So I want to tie that back. Like Everybody's looking at that chart now, right? If you're about to hit that buy button, boom, you want to get involved, right? What are the odds of the next move happening versus what it normally does and the next likely move? So this is kind of where the bullish echo comes into play. And I want to go right back to the newsletter because I want to bring this back and bring this in, right? So saying I ate less cake, therefore I ate healthy. So short selling a strong stock is not a good idea. We're going to kind of keep tying this back, right? Shorting a strong stock is a mistake. And I just want to say this as blatantly as possible. I'm going to highlight it and bold it in red. It is a monster mistake. As a matter of fact, it is a bad trade that works out one out of 10 times. The problem with us short-sighted traders is we remember the one and forget the other nine. Very important. All right. All right. This week is about risk reward. Let's just be super clear about that. Right. We can find dozens of setups. If not, again, we said went the list went from 29 to 204. So we're not lacking bullish ideas right now. But how many of them are good trades? I want you to write that down. It is really, really important. All right? There's a monster difference between the two. Again, getting back to Jesse Livermore. Jesse Livermore said he became profitable when he found patience. Patience to wait for the best trades and patience to hold the winners. So your challenge this week is going to be waiting for good ideas. And I'm going to give you a couple in just a minute, okay? To start the week, I'm looking to lock in profits, but still giving the winners a chance to go one more day. This is what we call the bullish echo setup. So that means moving up a trailing stop loss. So in the dozens and dozens of stocks that just absolutely exploded last week, you need to keep this in mind. Last week, <laughs> a lot of these ideas were A plus short sale setups. So they went from A plus short sales to rocket ship momentum in the other direction. Amazing if you have the game planning capability, which we're going to talk about in just a second. I'm going to walk you through a little bit of that to say, okay, I understand that the majority of stocks are going down right now. I understand that the market is going down right now, but the market came into a big level both the average true move to the downside, we called that last Monday. Go back and watch that video. Maybe I'll post the link here or in the description. Therefore, short selling was a good scenario, but the reward potential on new short sales diminished because most stocks used up most of what they normally do and they went into support. So this is the part that a lot of traders mess up, okay? Just because a scan had a list of stocks, that does not mean all of those stocks are trades. I want to say that one more time. Like, and again, we can go back to Finviz. We'll go back to the cover of Finviz here. And you see that like there's dozens of different stocks that meet all the criteria, right? There's usually a big giant list over here, right? It's all these different scenarios, right? Here's the thing you need to write down. Just because a stock meets the criteria for a scan does not mean it's a trade. It could be, but then you have to work your way through every single one of those setups and say, which of these setups that meet criteria for bullish order flow, which means that there's an obvious trend, which of them now are also good risk reward, which means you're at an optimal entry where if you buy at that moment, there's still most of that reward potential left. That's not the case for a lot of ideas today. So what that means heading into today is I am more likely to be moving up a trailing stop loss on this very fast move to the upside in a very tough market. 
Let's not forget what the market looked like prior to last Monday. And I want to give you a visual of that because it's very important, right? Here's the prior three weeks, a choppy bearish mess in here. So again, we constantly talk about this in the big picture of the market is it's, and we compare it to driving all the time. You can't get on the road and say, I just want to drive 75 because I want to. That's like saying every time I go out to the market, I have to buy because I want to. No, you have to be able to read what's going on in the market. So you understand, am I stepping on the gas, stepping on the brake, driving in and out of traffic, or am I the only one on the road and I can just put my radio on and go? The last three weeks prior to last week was a bearish, choppy mess. So we have to put that last week, all of this bullish amazingness into context. And for me, that means I am more concerned with locking in the earnings gap catalyst trades that we had last week and probably no better trade to look at than uh, AMD last week, right? Just amazing. And look, look at the breakdown of what we talked about here with a stock that pushed down into support, earnings came out, and this is what ended up unfolding. So what I am looking to do, and you can see where it is right now, I am looking to move up my trailing stop loss to where this breakout had, and I'm looking to lock in that trade as opposed to putting on a new one. So again, just think about this. How much of what AMD normally does, or whatever stock you might happen to be in right now, how much of what it normally does in a momentum move did it do last week? And how much is likely left in that trade right now? This is the bullish echo. The bullish echo is there's a big push. If you could imagine stepping on the gas, you let up on the gas because there's a speed trap up ahead, but you're still going forward. It's a, just a little bit further, but there's really no juice behind it. That's what a bullish echo is. You're still going in that direction. We're going to continue to move up trailing stop losses, but we're not getting out until it actually reverses. So the bullish echo actually gives you a chance to squeeze just a little bit more out of that idea, but you're not trading in the other direction and you're not getting out immediately because it's still going in that direction. But you're kind of like reading under the hood a little bit more that it's likely to slow down, if not reverse, but we're not going to get out until that does. That's a very important part. So the bullish echo is a strong move that has maybe a little bit more left before it resets for a new optimal entry. Remember, if you're new to the channel, and, and I'm very grateful that you're here with me today, we are trading a push and a pause. You might know that pause as a bull flag, as a pennant, whatever language you want to give it. I like to call it a pause because if you've ever written a trading manual, it's so hard to find like the perfect bull flag. But we're looking for a move and resetting the optimal entry. And then another move and then resetting the optimal entry. So what we have right now is we are at the top of that move and the risk is greater than the next likely reward. That's the biggest thing I want to get across. OK, actually, it looks like we have some new people in the community here today. Thank you. I really appreciate that. So let's let's kind of keep working our way through what the trades look like this week. So I'm going to jump right into the trades so you have them immediately. OK, so kind of working our way through um, sector rotation today. So. Here's the argument I used to make on the floor of my New York City trading office. If you don't know, I had 300 traders in my office in New York City. If the stock was an A-plus short sale just four days ago, how could it be an A-plus long today? The answer is it can't be. It's a violent move in the other direction. A lot of people might be calling this a short covering rally. But let's talk about that for a second. I do not believe this is a short covering rally because this was Jerome Powell fueled after his press conference last week which he's speaking again this week. We're going to talk about that in a second. And this is earnings related. Short covering rallies are typically where a bearish stock is going down. And if you could visualize this right now, let's say it just barely breaks below that level. And when it breaks below that, the next candle all of a sudden stops going down and reverses. So the people that shorted that, who bet on it going down after it broke that level, are now panicking because it stopped going down and you get that kind of violent move in the other direction. This week is a little bit different. The rallies that we've had this week, and if we kind of work our way into some of those rallies, these are fueled by earnings. A lot of these with massive, man, look at this move. <laughs> this wasn't an earnings move, but this is just absolutely amazing. I think that that group rallied because of, um, because of the interest rate conversations with Jerome Powell last week. 
But now you can actually start to see where we're starting to break this down, where some of these move. This is actually the one I wanted to get to. So you can actually see here, this is a short covering rally where it broke down, barely took out that level, and stopped going down and then rallied in the other direction. So I want to, I want to work our way back up to the list so we have the whole list of stocks, right? So here's the point that I want to get across. I am not convinced that the rally we had last week was short covering. And I want to explain why I'm saying that. Short covering implies people are exiting longs, but that the bearish move to the downside, excuse me, exiting shorts, but the bearish order flow is still valid. And there's no reason to believe that it changed. That's not the case with the price action we had last week. I don't think the big picture changed, but we're talking about stock-specific ideas, companies that just absolutely blew away what was expected, and guidance going forward was also good. So that means their next quarter, the next year, they're predicting will be pretty good based on the way things are unfolding. So because this is a positive earnings rally, that's different from people simply exiting a short sale. It's a different reason to expect it to continue. Now, we got to bring all of this together because we started today talking about the bullish echo. I am not talking about it going up for the next five days like it did last week or the next two weeks. It could go over the next two weeks, but I am not looking to take new risk unless the reward potential justifies that risk. So I'm going to, I'm going to give you a couple of ideas that I'm looking at for this week specifically. A couple of stocks that were strong really a couple of weeks ago kind of rallied. Actually, one of them last Monday we called out rallied $13, $14 coming out of one of our setups, right? And that was actually one that had relative strength while the market was going down. We're going to show you that in a second as well. Okay. So let's kind of go through the list. I just want to give everybody the list. All right. Uh, it's actually a really good question. Where am I setting my stops? Now, this is very important. Thank you, HA, for that question. We need to make a distinction of what kind of market condition we're in. And I'm going to, I want to give you a visual because it's very, very important, right? So let's take a look at the SPY. We're just going to use the, actually, we could actually use AMD, but we'll also use the spiral. So we want to, we want to compare this move with this move. Okay. So HH, thank you for that question. Really appreciate it. In this kind of move, I'd be more inclined to give the stock a little bit more room to breathe on the bullish side and allow it to pull back a little bit more because bullish momentum is trading in the same direction as bullish order flow. So we have two different time frames, so to speak, in sync. We do not have that in this move. This move, this bullish momentum move, is against three months of bearish order flow versus bullish order flow. So this buying pressure in the face of this selling pressure would have me not allow the stock to wiggle and jiggle a little bit more expecting a bigger move because this is against the dominant side of the market. So for me, that means I'd be a lot more aggressive with putting my stop loss up in this area here and being perfectly okay with getting out sooner because of what we talked about at the beginning of today's call, which is most of the average true move has been used up. And I want to talk, somebody actually mentioned here, this is not correct. Okay. I am not talking about the average true range of the market. Let's make a distinction here. And th Don, thank you for bringing this up. Average true range is what the stock does on a daily basis. The way that we created average true move, average true move is what it does in a bullish swing over a week to 10 days. That is a very big distinction. So Don, if you're, I don't know if you're a new member of our community, but what we talked about with the average true move of the S&P 500 on the bearish side of the market is roughly 30 points. So basically from here to here is 30 points. Very similar to the last move was roughly 30 points. That's the average true move. The average true range is the intraday criteria. So I want to make it clear what Don said there is a little bit different. It's not the same thing. Okay, but thank you for bringing that up, Don. I appreciate that. So essentially what we're looking to do, let's actually go back to AMD because this is very stock specific. AMD has really big resistance here that it kind of worked its way through in this 110 to 111 area. So I'm going to give it a little bit of room, but 111, the breakout, area, real breakouts follow through. If this breakout does not follow through, I want to get out on the way down and lock in the profits from this double inside day after earnings came out. 
So each stock will have its individual significant reference point that I'm going to be looking to lock in that profit. But I want to make sure I work all the way over to what I mentioned before about two different types of trades. So these earnings catalyst trades have been very violent. Most of them against moves to the downside rallying last week, right? There's one individual industry group looking at uh, that have been kind of trending slowly recently and are now reversing to the other side. But I want to show you how the trade management is different. Technology stocks versus these slow grinding stocks that just keep on going when they pick a direction. OK, uh, let's see. All right. So I want to work my way over into let's I want to get into the stock picks. That's really the biggest thing I want to get across for you. Right. So. Obviously, we just spent some time talking about risk reward. The good news is we have plenty of choices to game plan for, plenty of stocks to put in the tracking journal. Now, I want to—I just want to make it clear here. The trading game plan is the stocks we plan to trade right now. The tracking journal are what's going to end up being a lot of stocks that are in the list today, meaning they are still ideas, but not at a good risk reward. So we would set an alert. We would set a buy stop or a price that it would become better from a risk reward perspective. So when I just wrote tracking journal, that means a future trade that we want to pay attention to versus the game plan, an idea that we're looking to take today. And I'm going to give you a couple of those right now. Uh, let's see. Uh, hey, Justice, how's it going? Uh, can you just see the ATR by looking at the chart? Yes, for absolutely. For a day trade, you can. But for average true move, we're talking about a bigger move. Okay. And that's how we do things in our community. If you do things differently, that's fine. That's how we outline things in our community. All right, so let's get into the rest of the ideas, all right? Consumer cyclical stocks posted the most stocks with bullish stacked order flow. Now, that's a very important statement right there. When an individual sector has a big list of stocks that have institutional concentration, that means the smart money is paying attention. We should also be paying attention. But now we have to be looking to set up ideas, all right? Gambling and residential housing gave us incredible rallies, putting up percentage moves that typically would take weeks, right? DraftKings rallied 23% in just two days. Now, take a look. And again, let's for uh, both HH and Justice, this is kind of like a really good lesson here. Like, if you take a look and see what DraftKings normally does when it rallies, and there's a move right there, there's a big move right there, a big move there before it paused again, what are the odds of this continuing? For the next move to justify the risk. So again, getting back to um, what Don is saying here is, is if why wouldn't we just look at that daily candle? Well, that's not a normal daily candle. That's why. That's why it has to be over a little bit bigger time. I don't want to turn this into a coaching call. I want to give you stock picks. Okay. All right. So amazing moves, but there's very little beef left on the bone. And that's these kind of ideas right here. So if you get, this is the last bearish move. This is the last bearish move. This is the last bearish move. What are the odds of that following through? I just want to keep drilling this point home because a lot of people buy at the wrong time. Despite the big moves, a couple of other gambling-related stocks have entry setups worth considering, right? These are initial reversals into new bullish order flow, which means for me, a lower initial position. That is critical to understand. I'm going to show you the chart, but that is critical. One of the biggest, quote unquote, secrets in the market is understanding when to trade bigger and when to work your way into a position. It is literally the secret to trading profitably, other than obviously understanding good ideas, right? So that's an important part. LVS is a good example. Three higher lows since reporting. And you can see here, we had this big bottom here. One, two, three higher lows. One, two, three higher highs. So it's starting to grind its way higher. I want to keep that grinding conversation going, right? When is scheduled to report next week? So what we're looking at now is industry group specific stocks that are still relatively close to an optimal entry, but not even close to being way beyond like the other ones we just looked at. Dick Sporting Goods is another one. I want to get up to Coinbase today, too. That's a big one as well. After a failed breakdown, which is the red arrow over here. So remember, we just talked about short covering rally. That's a short covering rally after this breakdown failed. All right. Uh, Dick Sporting Goods is interesting, but needs to break the 118 level. So again, this is tracking journal stuff. This is where he gapped down on last earnings report. This is, the, this is the biggest thing I want to get across here today. This is not a trade until it gets beyond this level and pauses. So do you see what we keep talking about, Jesse Livermore, patience? 
This is the part of trading where traders chase the price, pulls back, gets stopped out, and then does exactly what you thought it was going to do. And that's actually, I'm going to tie that back to coins. So be patient on this one. Write this price down. I'm waiting for Dick Sporting Goods to pause above 118 before I put on a new trade. Okay. All right. All right. Luckily, bore, and then, then we're getting into more specific ideas. Boring but obvious insurance stocks offer up entries for today. And Don, since you're in our community, could actually ask that question in a game plan call after this one, or you could ask it on the coaching call tonight. All right. All, all State and Chubb both paused and traded into inside days while other high-profile high stocks got all the love Thursday price. So this is the point I want to get across. All State paused just in front of a breakout level, and so did CB. Now, this is the thing I want to point out. Real breakouts follow through. Now, a giant part of this setup is it punched through the level and paused for two days. There was an inside day followed by another inside day. So this is a visual. This is really the point I want to get across. This is a visual of resetting a new optimal entry. It broke through, paused for one day, paused for a second day, gives us a good risk profile in exchange for the next move in the other direction. Now, this is the important part because we get these <laughs> we get these kind of comments on YouTube all the time, and I completely understand. I'm looking for that stock, CB, to break out out of the daily inside candlesticks. And if it does, great. That's going to start a new position. Now, here's the part where we get the YouTube comments that people take everything I say out of context. If that stock trades down and does not break out of Thursday and Friday's price action, there's no trade. That's very important. So again, remember talking about patience. Patience to wait for the setup. Patience to hold the winner. In this case, if these breakout trades break down, that's okay. Everything we do is about having an edge, what happens most of the time. And that's a big thing a lot of people mistake as well. Losing trades are a business expense. They're a part of trading. If anybody who tells you that they don't have losses, they're full of beans. Let's put that out there right now, all right? But as far as this is concerned and this trade, if it breaks out, I'm going to get it. If it breaks down and does not give us the entry, I'm leaving it alone. That is super important to understand. Very important. And again, you might want to watch this one more time to take the uh, take some notes. Got a lot of good ones in here today. All right. One stock worthy of our attention is coin. Now, this is a really interesting one. And you want to, you want to copy and paste this entire thing because it's, it's an entire argument for an idea. It's not just boom and hit a scenario because it's not clean, but I want to explain why. Coinbase Global 86 represents a monster level for the bear. So let's actually pull that out and take a look at the chart and show you exactly what I mean. Okay. Uh, Eddie, this is reminiscences of a stock operator. So I'll pop that in there for you. This book is probably a must have for anybody who loves trading. This is the book was written in 1923. Actually, 100 years old. Wow, that's amazing. I didn't realize it was 100 years old. All right. So the stock I want to talk about is coin. So everybody can obviously see what's going on here, right? So let's break down the idea. The stock price broke out on the Grayscale ETF news. That was this push over here, right? Very big news for, for uh, crypto. All right. Only to break down again, then probably break out again last week. So broke out, broke down, broke out again, right? If you're smart with position sizing, do you see how I keep bringing position sizing into the conversation? And I, I just really want to get this across to everybody because it means a lot to me. If you learn nothing else from today's video, learn this. Each trade requires different risk because each trade will have different conditions to put that trade on. So just think about how you drive. It's not smart. To just say all the time, I want to drive as fast as possible. But traders, inexperienced traders who've never been exposed to these kinds of lessons, think that every trade is the same. It's not. <laughs> so we have to make sure that we are allocating money into that trade appropriate to the quality of the idea, which, again, is kind of taking me back to coin because I'm being very deliberate about how I'm talking about position sizing here. Okay. So if you're smart with position sizing, this can be a big winner to end the year. That's a pretty bold statement right there. We're talking about the possibility of a big move for the year. A small entry and a plan to add with positive bullish momentum is my focus. 
Those two sentences right there are everything. I am literally planning out a smaller initial position size because it's not yet obvious, but continues to test this level. So if it breaks out and we get a push and a pause, a push and a pause, it starts to follow through, I will add as it moves in my favor. But because I realize it's still sideways and not yet validating that, I'm putting less into the trade to start. If that concept is new to you, I'm glad I'm the first one to introduce it to you, but just think about driving. You can't drive safely all the time at max speed. Learning to make these distinctions when you look at patterns and chart setups and new trades, you have to ask yourself, how likely is it to continue? And what does that mean for how I want to get into this trade to start? Again, just keep going back to driving. All right, so let's talk about the rest of the trade. Because of the volatility, which is how much the stock moves, and three-month trading range, this is a delicate trade that could yield a big move. And here's the important part. This is really the crux of it. There is not stacked order flow here, but a confluence of events that have me interested. So it Stacked order flow means that it's obviously going in that direction and it's been going in that direction for a while. That's what stacked means. How long has it been happening? In this case, there's a lot of news on Coinbase and even Coin Bitcoin has been rallying for a while. The stock has not yet gone. It's right at a big level. If it gets above that level, stays there, working into that, looking for stacked order flow will then have us hang on to that. Now, I want to kind of tie back to the ideas that we we're talking about before. Um, I want to go down here. Two restaurant stocks near solid entries, which include McDonald's and DRI Darden. After a double bottom support, McDonald's produced higher highs with room to go. So that means stacked order flow and profit potential. So get that in your head. Like when you're mapping out your trades, how much room to go does this stock have in order for me to justify risk? Room to go equals profit potential. Profit potential means you're buying it at or near an optimal entry. How do you know you're near an optimal entry? What does the stock normally do based on where I'm about to buy it? Kind of bringing today's lessons all back together, right? So this is really the one I want to talk about. So you can see here the difference between a stock that just rocketed versus a stock that rocketed, paused, and then moved again. So this is the start of a move. This is validation. Very important to make that distinction. So the first move would be lower initial position size because it just started. But after it pauses and goes again, we can put more into the idea because we got positive feedback. Very important to understand. And earnings came out, which kind of supported that, right? That's kind of the theme for last week. DRI shows nearly three weeks of bullish order flow. So again, stacked order flow over time. What we're looking to say is how long has somebody with deep pockets been buying the stock? Is it an hour, a day, a week, or a couple of months? The more money they have in the deal, and how do we know they have more money in the deal? Because they're paying higher prices. They're holding higher levels, and they've done it over time. So let me just ask you a question. Does that kind of make sense that it's really not our job to predict? It's so much easier to use a dynamic rotational method to say how long have they been buying? Is there a whole group of stocks that they've been buying? Are they paying higher prices? Are they holding higher lows? How long has that been happening? That's where it becomes infinitely easier to rocket your conviction level and your confidence in the market because you're no longer predicting what's going to happen next. You are simply shadowing the deep pockets that move stocks up and down. We just need to say it's happening. How do I know when it stops? That's it. <laughs> There's no more complicated part of trading than that. We make it complicated because we want to feel smart, but really it comes down to it's going. How long has it been going and how do we know when it stops? That's it. I hate to break the news to you, but once you understand how to read the market, it's a question of reading it and not predicting. Okay, I just want to say that out loud. So let's get into a little bit more of, of why I'm talking about a different way of managing this, okay? Something to note with both of these stocks is they are grinders, not typically associated with fast momentum, but each can sustain a slow moving trend. That's a very important distinction to make, all right? The reason I mention this is because that trait requires a different type of trade management. 
So I want to be clear about this. What we are walking you through today, what hopefully you're learning from me today, is that all price action is not the same. Every stock is not the same. The one distinction they all have is we can make a quick dis discovery. <laughs> is, is it obvious and how long has it been obvious? But then we need to make a decision on how we plan to manage that profitable trade. And that's what I want to show you right now in these stocks. I just wanted to make sure it was really important. Okay. So I tend to use moving average crossovers to hold stocks that have these slow grinding type moves. All right. The DRI's optimal entry was the inside day near 144. So it needs to pause for a new trade, but I like the price action. So here's the point that I want to make. You can see that when you spot and have the right kind of trade management using multiple moving averages, DRI was kind of a super easy trade on the short side for over $30. And now you can see we actually started new bullish order flow and the moving averages in this case have crossed up. Now, I want to get this across. I don't use moving average crossovers 90% of the time because most of the stocks I trade are active and they have momentum and we could read that push in the pause and that kind of stuff. These kinds of slower grinding stocks really don't have clean pushes and pauses. They just have like these slope. They're like, the, you know, they're like a, like a cruise ship. They just keep going and they take forever to turn around. But when you could make that distinction between those two kinds of ideas, it really changes because now you're like, that's the right kind of price at a price and trade management for that particular idea. Now, these are the kind of discussions, obviously, that we want to have all the time uh, as the market conditions unfold. And this is what I do for everybody every day in our community, both real time uh, as well as in our newsletter every day. So I want to be clear, the bullish echo this week is a very strong momentum move that might have another day or two at the most, but does not set a new trade yet until the pause, the optimal entry resets to justify what we need to risk in exchange for the profit. So in other words, am I risking a dollar to make a dollar? Don't do that. <laughs> I want to risk a dollar to make three, five, or seven because the next move is likely. That is what will separate you from everybody who says trading is really hard and you're just saying, I like it, but not yet, or I like it, and there's the optimal entry, and there's what's likely to happen. So that's kind of where we tie back in the bullish echo, and the opposite of the bullish echo is the optimal entry, which is we're at the start of a new move, and it hasn't reached or approached what it normally does. So there's an exercise that you can kind of do for yourself, in, and let me actually just kind of pull this over here. If we kind of go into, let's say the stocks in the, let's go to the Dow Jones. Uh, and just pull up that list, just click on each stock and say when it rallies, how much does it normally go? And you can start to get a feel for what kind of profits are available just at the time that you're going to be buying the stock. Now, here's a big thing as well. There's bullish moves in bullish markets and there's bullish moves in bearish markets. You're going to trade those differently because the underlying condition is different. All right. I know that uh, I know it's Monday. Maybe you didn't even have your full coffee yet, but this is the kind of stuff that makes a big difference in your conviction level. When you understand what's going on and how much it recently moved, is it obvious? Pick a side. Pick a spot is the last part. Pick a side, pick a spot. When you master those two really important things, the rest of it's kind of easy. It's like, how do we manage the winners and where do we kick out the ones that aren't following through? That's where trading can be the most beautiful business in the world because now you're running it and you're in control of it as opposed to hoping the market does you a favor. So remember, we are shadowing the institutions. We are not predicting where things are going to go next. They have all the deep pockets. They have all the research teams. It's our job to read what they're doing, understand how long they've been doing it, and then have a set of rules in place to say that condition has changed. And that's a really fun part of trading because now we're in control of the outcome and we're in control of when we get involved. So um, actually, I have to go. We got to get ready for our next meeting, which is this morning. Look, thank you so much for being here. Obviously, if you want to get all of this stuff for me every single day, including my swing trades, um, sign up for the Daily Ticket newsletter. It's 90 days for $297. Click At least click and learn about it. There's a link in the description. Uh, but first, I want to say how grateful I am that you've been here with me every single week. I really, really appreciate it. If we did a good job, do me a favor, give us a thumbs up and hit subscribe. I'd really appreciate it. One more thing. We covered a lot of lessons here today. If these lessons on trade management, the bullish echo, when to use moving average crossovers, how to trade at the optimal entry, if this stuff is new to you, 
please do me a favor. Watch the video again, take notes, and then when you have follow-up questions, leave those notes in the comments, and I promise to get back to you as soon as possible. All right? Thank you so much, everybody. I'll speak to you soon. Have an awesome day.